Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I love that when I can quiet a crowd. Good evening, it's so nice to have you here. My name is Tom Reese. I'm privileged to serve as president of Concordia University in St. Paul. We're excited to have such a large crowd gathered here tonight on our campus and also online for this special occasion. Today we are pleased to have Cheryl Strayed talking to us about her life journey and the lessons she has learned through difficult times and what she calls bearing the unbearable. As most, most of you know, Cheryl Strayed is the author of the number one New York Times bestselling memoir, Wild. At the tender age of 22, Stray had found herself shattered by two major life events, her mother's unexpected death from cancer and the end of her young marriage. After hitting rock bottom, Cheryl decided to confront her emotional pain by trekking over 1,000 miles along the Pacific Crest Trail. Most of you are aware, Wild is her story of this hike peppered with the colorful characters and unbelievable experiences she encountered, encountered along the way as she struggles to find inner peace and stability. Ms. Strayed is also the author of the New York Times bestseller, Tiny Beautiful Things, and the critically acclaimed novel, Torch. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the Washington Post Magazine, Vogue, Allure, and in other publications. Ms. Strayed holds a Master's of Fine Arts in Fiction Writing from Syracuse University, and of course a Bachelor's Degree from the University of Minnesota. There you go. The second best college in Minnesota. <laughs> Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Cheryl Strayed. I can't believe this. <laughs> Hello. Wow, how many fucking people are in the room? <laughs> Thank you for coming. I cannot believe um, that you're all here on this nice night. You should be having like barbecues in your backyards and stuff. Thank you so much. It means so much to me to be here in my home state, my beloved Minnesota. I. <laughs> Thank you. I live in Portland, Oregon, but you guys, everything I mention, we cheer. You know, I just, so, so I, we should, maybe we should just run through all of my sort of Minnesota places and everyone can shout if you represent that. So when I was, when I first moved to Minnesota, I was six, I moved to Chaska. <laughs> Is Chaska in the house? Um, all right. Um, and how many of you know me from Chaska? All right. And then I moved to Beaver Township. Does anyone? <laughs> if you know where Beaver Township, Minnesota is, you know me. <laughs> Um, and then, I, of course, I came to the Twin Cities and went to college. Um, first of all, St. Thomas, which I'll talk about in a moment, and the University of Minnesota. Are we, we have some Tommies, too. Awesome. Well, it just means so much to me, honestly. I feel like um, Minnesota, you know, even though I wasn't born here and I don't live uh, here anymore, that's, this is home to me. And whenever I'm here, there's just a feeling of, I feel like I feel this place in my blood, I think in a way that we can come to feel places um, as sacred in our lives. And so Minnesota is absolutely sacred ground for me. Um, I am gonna talk to you tonight about my book, Wild, and also about just the journey since then. I, I, I don't know if any, many of you are aware that the book is now about to become, it has, it has become a film, which will be in theaters in December. It's very exciting. 
And, uh, you know, it's just been this really interesting journey, a, a pretty wild journey, I have to say. Not only, you know, having the experience of living the experience and then writing the experience, which really demands such a deep examination of the experience in order to craft it into literature. Um, and then to bring it into the world and to have happened, uh, you know, what happened is essentially people all over the world read the book and took it into their own hearts and minds and lives and shared, shared that with me. But to, to now have this other iteration, this film uh, starring Reese Witherspoon as me, Laura Dern as my mom, um, and seeing actual scenes from my life reenacted. Um, there are so many scenes in the movie that are just straight, not only from the book, but from my life. And I, I was very involved in the film, got to watch, uh, stand there as they were, as the actors were acting out these scenes. Those, those of you who are really familiar with the book will recognize some things as very true. There are also a couple of things in the movie that are a little less accurate. For example, I never did have sex with two guys in an alley. But... Um, <laughs> But, but I have that to look forward to. Um, so, so you never know where life will take you, right? Um, I have to get some water here. So anyway, the film will actually be screened this Friday at the Twin Cities Film Fest. Do you all know that? And sadly, I can't be there for it, but I know some of you are going to get the chance to see it, and then you can go see it in the theaters, um, you know, in December. And I'll talk about more about it later. But let me first go back to the beginning. Um, most of you probably know essentially the premise of Wild. What happens in Wild is I hike 1,100 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail when I was 26 in, in the summer of 1995. And I really um, began that journey. And so much of, you know, obviously in Wild, I tell the story of that hike, which was incredibly fun and adventuresome and physically daunting and, and beautiful. Um, but I think most importantly that the book is really, and the experience that I lived, was really so much more about a pretty universal journey um, that, that we all have to go on at some point in our lives. Um, when we have to essentially face who it is we are and the life it is we have and come to terms with that. The truth of both the sorrow and the pain in our lives and the, and the beauty and, and um, to in some ways own fully all of the things for which we need to be grateful, those things that drive us forward. And um, my, you know, I, I would say absolutely, you know, really very clearly um, this journey for me, um, the catalyst for it was the death of my mom in March of 1991. She died when she was 45 of cancer. She died really suddenly. Uh, she had been uh, this vibrant, healthy woman, a woman who I think of now as a young woman. I, I just turned 46 last month, so I'm gonna say 45 is young. I don't care who tells me otherwise. Um, really young, you know, to think that I have now outlived my mother, just such a profound thing for me. Um, my mom, when she died, uh, was actually a senior in college. I love to talk at colleges, especially this college, just a, a few miles away from the college where she and I attended. Um, she had been a, um, really all of her life, somebody who loved knowledge, and she was such a creative spirit, always making things and growing things and sewing things and reading and, and all of those, you know, uh, things that we as associate with intellectual pursuit, but my mom had never had the opportunity um, to go to college. She got pregnant when she was 19 and not married, and it was the 60s, and um, you know, what, what women did at, at that time in our culture when that happened is they, you know, they married the guy, and that's what my mom did. She married uh, my father. And together they had three kids. I was the middle child. Um, I have an older sister and a younger brother. And we had, you know, really those early years, very, very difficult, very challenging because my father was an abusive, violent, tyrannical um, person who, who didn't, um, you know, his main outlet was rage. I know some of you have had 
people like that in your life too. And it's, it's an incredibly difficult thing. It's an incredibly um, hard thing, um, not only to endure, but to break out of. Um, but my mom did, you know, eventually after many times of leaving and coming back and being told that she should stay and try to work it out and all of the things, um, that cycle of abuse that, that one can get involved in, um, my mom finally said, I can't do this. And um, she left my dad. We, we were living in Chaska, Minnesota at the time. And um, it was there that I think my life, you know, I think of the decisions I made that made my life possible, that brought me here to this moment, you know, before you on this stage. But in so many ways, of course, those decisions also go back to the choices our parents made. And I think that that decision my mom made to leave my father and not have me and my brother and sister live in that kind of violence and hatred is so essential to me. You know, it, it made it possible that I could have really essentially the joyous childhood that I ultimately did have. We didn't have a lot. We were quite poor. My mother, you know, worked a number of different jobs. And, um, and then after she married my stepfather as well, you know, we were always piecing it together. Um, but we had everything we wanted. One of the things my mom would always say um, that I found absolutely insufferable was, um, we're not poor we're rich because we're rich in love. And of course I would roll my eyes at this as a teenager and be like, yes, mom, you know, whatever, you know, but, I, but, but later, years later, um, I realized how right she was, you know, how love is the nutrient we need. And, and, and essentially, if we have that, we have everything. And so we had that. And when my mom died, I lost the source of that nutrient. I knew, inst you know, instinctively that nobody would ever love me again the way that my mother loved me. Um, it was a, the kind of loss in my life that was permanent and that would be ongoing. And I didn't know how to live with that. I didn't know how I could thrive and be happy. Um, like I said, we had been seniors in college. But by this time, um, I should back up and explain how it was that my mom came to, went to college. Um, I, I grew up in the little town of McGregor, near the town of McGregor, Minnesota, in rural Aiken County, and um, was really always, you know, a secret, a secret inside myself was that I had to be a writer. Ever since I was, learned how to read when I was six or seven, I just knew this was the thing, this was my calling, this was what I was going to do in the world. And some of my friends from McGregor can attest that I was um, using these skills. In fact, um, one time my friend Erica, who's here, I, I, had, I was like madly in love with this guy named Jeff. And um, I wrote him either a love letter or a breakup letter. And for some reason, I showed it to Erica. And she said, you know, you're really good at that. Um, and she said, you should write letters for other people to their boyfriends. <laughs> Do you remember that, Erica? Yeah. So I, I never went into that business. But if you guys are interested, talk to me afterwards. But um, so I was, you know, really a writer. And I knew that I needed to... Uh, leave this town, this little town where I grew up and go off in the big wide world and find my place, get an education. And so I, I didn't know the process really by which one gets to college. I don't know why. I'm still kind of, I only, I guess, blame myself about this. Why, why I thought that um, you should only, for example, apply to one school. Um, so nobody told me, you know, apply across the board. So I applied to St. Thomas. And they sent me a letter of acceptance. And in this letter, they said, um, if you go here, your parents can go to college for free. And my mom said, I have always wanted to go to college. And I thought, no fucking way are you going with me. <laughs> and, um, right? Right? Does it, would anyone sign up for that? Would anyone, when you are 17, the last thing you want at college is your mother. Um, and this is what happened. I, so, you know, the first, I did think no, and, and I didn't, um, couldn't stop there. You know, I just, 
I knew even though I had all of that youthful sort of healthy antagonism towards my mom, I also knew who she was to me. She was my hero even then. And, you know, buried, you know uh, layer, layered on, under, beneath all those facades that one has to adopt when you're a teenager, that distance against your parents. Um, I knew that, that I couldn't stand in the way of my mom and this wonderful opportunity. So we made an agreement that if she went to school at St. Thomas and we should encounter each other on the tiny St. Thomas campus, um, that she would not acknowledge me or say hello or in any way address me unless I said hello to her. It was like I was like the Queen of England or something, you know? <laughs> One must not speak to the Queen um, unless spoken to. And my mom, you know, she understood. She was, she knew, she knew. And it was interesting that just a few weeks ago, after years of having the most like shameful basement of like boxes of junk and everything, um, I'm having somebody help me go through all my things and just organized so I can have an organized life. Um, and I just, she put all these letters that she found in this, in this box and I just reached into one and I, there were, it was a card. And it was the card that my mom wrote to me um, the day I moved out of our house and went to, moved into the dorm at St. Thomas. And it was so beautiful because, you know, she was, she was saying in the letter, all of her wishes for me, all of her hopes. And she was saying, you know, even though, even though I'm going to college with you, um, this is really about you, Cheryl. This is your moment. And the thing that, that makes, I mean, I'm so grateful for that kind of love. It also sort of breaks my heart because now I'm old enough that I can see that it was my mom's moment too. You know, that this was a moment that she earned um, that she sacrificed for a long time to get. And so when she died over the spring break of our senior year, by then we had each transferred to, I transferred to the University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities and she went to the U of M in Duluth. When she died, it was like this, she had two classes left um, before, short shy of her bachelor's degree. And, you know, so I felt the enormous weight of my loss, my grief, I felt the enormous weight too of what she'd lost, which was her life, which was everything that I presumed was to come um, that I was mistaken about. And I didn't know how to live. I didn't know how uh, to continue on really with grace. Um, and I know so many people who have had that experience too. The, one of the most glorious things, I will, I will say probably the most glorious things thing, and I'm in this also including like, you know, movie stars making movies about the book and Oprah and all of these things, is by far, I mean, there's no comparison. Those things are wonderful, but by far the most important thing is just the people every single day now for, uh, you know, ever since the book was published about two and a half years ago, looking me in the eye and saying, thank you, I know, I know what you mean. I had that too, I had that feeling too. I felt seen by you, I had that kind of loss. Nobody ever said how I felt, I thought I was the only one. And I really wrote, all of that stuff I wrote in Wild about my wild grief, I wrote it with a lot of um, fear that the book would be read and scorned, like, oh, she's just too much. You know, she's too much. And what I found is um, that, it, that it was actually just enough. And it was actually just speaking to the truth of what it means to grieve. And for whatever reason, um, we as a society aren't really good at telling that story, like the full, savage, raw truth of what it means to lose somebody who's essential to you. And so the greatest gift to me in Writing Wild has been, has been that, like being that a voice that, that contributes to a conversation that I think we need to have. Um, and I grieved in ways, you know, that were, and I wrote about in full, you know, in, in, in Wild. I grieved in ways that were um, noble and, and strong and trying, I tried very hard to keep my life together and then also found that I couldn't. I wanted, when I say I wanted to keep my life together, what I really wanted was life to be exactly as it was, um, except minus my mother. 
And what I learned, which many of you have learned when you lose someone like that, is that there's no such thing. You know, that, that, that life has to reshape itself around um, that absence rather than the presence. And it looks differently. Um, absence looks differently than presence. And so I, I reeled against it. I was also in my early 20s. I was trying to figure out who I was. And I did all the things that you do in your early 20s, um, maybe with just a little more force in my case. I was uh, married at the time to someone I loved and who was you know, a good person. But I just couldn't sustain that. I got very involved with lots of people in, in sort of wildly promiscuous ways. No menage a trois in the alleyways, but um, you know things along those lines that were just ultimately destructive to me. And and one of these guys was just starting to use heroin when I met him, and he said, "Do you want to try it?" And I did, and it was the first thing that actually worked. The first time I used heroin, it was really this experience that I felt like it was like the cure. You know, it was the thing I was seeking, which was relief or a sense that, um, that it was okay, that I was okay even though my mom was dead. And of course it was a disastrous um, cure. It wasn't a cure at all. It was something that, that spun me deeper into you know, despair and, and a sense of desperation. And so it was really at that moment, you know, my, my bottom point that I just thought, and by bottom point, what I mean really is just that, that place where I thought, for the first time ever in my life, um, why am I here? I, there is no reason for me to live. One of my favorite lines in the movie um, of Wild, Reese Witherspoon says, um, somebody, somebody asks, you know, this therapist in, in the session asks her, um, what she feels about herself, and she says, "I know, I know that I mattered," and I th and I think I love that line so much. I talked to the to Reese and the screenwriters and um, in the process of making Wild, and I said, "You know, one thing you have to understand is even though I was in this moment, this era of my life that I didn't know why I should go on living, I was also this person who had been loved really well all my life." I'd been loved by somebody who always made me know that I mattered. And I think that when I lost my mom, I didn't know that I, that I hadn't lost that. I didn't know that I hadn't lost that thing that you get when somebody loves you well. And it took me some growing up to understand that that would stay with me all of my life. And I think that um, that you know, when I was at that bottom, that's what ultimately allowed me to decide to change my life and save myself, is that it wasn't that I thought I was so important, it wasn't that I thought that I was worth saving, but what I thought was my mother loved me too well for me to ruin myself. If the meaning of my mother's life was her children's lives, which it, which it ultimately was, that's what she would have told you it was, then I can't destroy that. You know, I, I'm responsible for her legacy. I have to be the woman she raised me to be. I have to um, honor the sacrifices she made for me and do something, be the beneficiary of that rather than the person who squanders that. It seems so simple. It was really a very powerful realization that I had in the midst of that deep sorrow. And I didn't know how I would go about changing and being this person my mom raised me to be, but I knew I would. And it was just then that there was a blizzard in Minnesota, which as you know, there often is. And um, I went to REI, the one in Bloomington or outside of Bloomington, right? Yeah, yeah, you guys know. I went there. And I bought a shovel. I wanted to buy a foldable, like, kind of camp shovel that I would just keep in my truck because I needed to dig it out. And there was this book um, for sale. And as I was waiting in line to pay for it, I picked up the book. And it was called The Pacific Crest Trail, Volume 1, California. I'd never heard of the Pacific Crest Trail before. Um, 
but I flipped it over and I read the back and it said that it was this national scenic trail that went from the Mexican border to a few miles into Canada up the spine of the Sierra Nevada and the Cascade Range through California and Oregon and Washington. And there really was something inside of me that just opened up, that just said, do this. And you know, I've always believed in trusting Trusting the body, trusting the gut, trusting the heart. And in that moment, I did. So much has been said about, um, about that decision. It, oftentimes, it's been written about. I've had to get used to being written about in ways that are sometimes a little uncomfortable for me because they sometimes feel like not quite accurate. Um, and, and in this case, people will say, she made this impulsive decision out of nowhere with no experience. And, and I understand um, where that comes from. And those of you who read the book do too, probably. But um, <laughs> I'll admit that there were some things for which I was unprepared. Um, but I will say, I had grown up in rural Aiken County, Minnesota. Have any of you, how many of you have been to Beaver Township? All right, we have not many of you. You should visit. It's a mecca of woods and bogs and gravel roads and a few people, most of them lovely. Um, we, I had lived there all through my teen years. I, my family moved there when I was 12 and we didn't have um, electricity or running water or indoor plumbing for the first year or two. And then all through my high school years, we never did have indoor plumbing. My mother and stepfather didn't get a toilet until I was like a sophomore or junior in college. Um, I had lived, I'd had this experience of living in the wild. The 40 acres we owned were really just for miles in every direction. Those of you who have been there know. It's just woods and, and bogs and, and gravel roads and animals. And, you know, I mean, I, I really, as a teenager, for the first time had that opportunity to, to learn what it felt like to um, be, in, you know, one with nature. As a teenager, I didn't always value that experience. You know, you don't, as a teenager, generally want to have to, you know, poop in a bucket. Um, but, <laughs> which I had to do. We called it a honey bucket, though. Remember the honey bucket, Stacy? Yeah. Um, I had to wash my hair in like a pot heated up over the wood stove and do all of these sort of rustic things. And my mom would always say, you know, you're going to thank me someday for this. You're going to thank me for this experience. And I would just roll my eyes and sigh, you know. Um, but it was really, I think, you know, that moment when I decided to hike the PCT, um, the, the part when people say it was impulsive and based on nothing, what I think is, no, no, it was based on this decision my mom made and my stepfather made to go and, you know, give us this opportunity to, to live out in the woods. Um, to feel what it means to be a human um, in, a, in a place that's, that's not about humans, that's really about the natural world. And it was, you know, really years later when I was writing about that decision to go hike the PCT that I remembered my mom. I remember my mom saying, thank you. You know, my, remember my mom said, you're going to thank me someday. And I remember feeling thankful because I think that what my mom did is the most important thing probably any parent can do for their ch children is to give them the tools that they need to save themselves when saving is to be done. And that is what my mom gave me. It was that experience I had that really led to that feeling when I picked up that book that opened my heart and said, go. So I went. And I wasn't the most likely you know, from the outside, it seemed like I, maybe this wasn't the right moment um, to go set about on an 1,100-mile wilderness trek. I was definitely, you know, in this um, time of my life when I was still very much mired in that self-destructive stuff I was talking about. But I trusted the instincts, and I got myself ready for the trail. And I gathered my, you know, I went every week to REI with my wad of cash for my waitressing job. Is anyone here from Nikki's Cafe? 
I know there's one person in the audience who was a waitress with me, right? Is Rachel here? Um, I waited tables and I would go buy things from Nikki's, or, I mean from REI. I would say, I'm gonna go on a big trip, and they'd say, we have lots of great stuff to sell you. REI is so good at that. <laughs> Does anyone here work at REI? I love REI, just for the record. The funny thing about the film, it's like this huge advertisement for REI. And um, what, what just, it's really, because in the book, I wrote things like, you know, REI is gonna be my favorite company forever, which is what I said in my life, so I wrote that in the book. But then when it's in the film with Reese, it seems like totally like product placement, you know, but it's, <laughs> it's actually what happened. Um, but, you know, I got myself to this town of Mojave, California with all my stuff, and there I was, and I was going to go backpacking the next day. And it was really there that I, you know, looked at all this stuff and I did think, holy smokes, I have never technically gone backpacking before. Um, and I packed that pack. Those of you who've read the book know it was a lot of stuff, some of it necessary, some of it less necessary. And my pack was too heavy to lift. I found that I couldn't lift it at all. It was like an unmovable beast, a monster, as I call it in the book, and as I called it in life. And I think it was, you know, all those years later, I didn't know for several years that I was going to even write about my hike or that I should, but it was later when I was trying to figure out whether this, this story was something that could hold itself up in literature, that it, when I was writing that scene about having all that stuff and not being able to lift that pack, that I, that I realized that that was, for me, the, the entire meaning of this journey. You know, I was trying to answer this question, how is, it that, how is it that I can bear the unbearable? How is it that I can accept what's true and live my life? And there I was in, in, in actual life presented with the physical, literal manifestation of that very spiritual, psychological, emotional question. Um, I was alone with something I couldn't lift and I had to lift it. And I really wrote from that place of knowing and that place of truth. And when I did that, I knew that I was not just telling my own story. I knew that I was telling everyone's story. You know, that, that to me was the most interesting thing. One thing that happens a lot with memoir, um, it gets sort of a bad rap. People confuse, they think, if anyone who would write a book about themselves must be a narcissist, must be like, come listen to me, I'm so interesting, you'll be amused and entertained and informed. And I, that I couldn't, I have no interest in that. I didn't want to regale you with my heroic hike. I don't think it was a heroic hike. I think I was in a heroic battle to find my way back to the, to the person I knew I was. And the way that I did that was really through this hike. And so once I had that consciousness that it was not, that the wild wasn't going to be about me, even though it was gonna demand like absolute um, revelation on my part, af absolute transparency, um, a kind of a level of candidness and truth and honesty that you know, is terrifying to me and uncomfortable, um, I, that, that's what allowed me to do it is that I was like, okay, we're, I'm trying to tell a story about what it means to be human, which is what literature aspires to do. It's certainly everything I've aspired to do as an artist. So I did that. I lifted the pack. If you want to know how, you have to read the book. How many of you have, have any, so, so have a lot of you read the book? <laughs> Yay! Thank you. And those who haven't, you can purchase your own copy. Um, one spoiler is I survived, and, um, <laughs> you know, I got out there, and it was hard as hell. I didn't see another person for the first eight days of my hike. It was physically absolutely demanding. Everywhere the pack made contact with my body, I lost flesh. I was bleeding. I was blistered. I lost six toenails. I was alone a lot, really alone, and it was the most astounding experience you can possibly imagine. You know, it, it did what I wanted it to do and more in a way that I didn't quite expect. You know, I expected a kind of emotional um, 
I expected to get out there and get in touch with myself. And what I realized when I got out there is I was already really in touch with myself. And in some ways, what I needed to do is get over myself and move forward and move on and to say, this really hurts and away we go. And in the act of hiking, I had to do that every day, every minute, you know, one step at a time. I had to walk even when it hurt. I had to live my life without my mom even though I didn't want to. And I had to do all kinds of the things that we all have to do. I had to think about my dad who had failed me so profoundly and I had to forgive him so that I could, so that I could have the life that I, that I deserve to have in spite of him. I had to forgive myself for the things I regret having done. I had to come to terms with everything, you know, like we all do. But I think that's what's so profound about journey, is it's like a step out of life. Um, it gives us an opportunity to reflect on who we are, um, who we owe, who we need to make amends to, and to forgive the, the, the wrongs that have been done to us. That was certainly my experience on, on the trail. Sometimes people will say of my hike that I ran away from my life or I ran away from things. And I always think, no, it was the opposite. I ran into my life. You know, heroin was running away. Having sex with anyone I met was running away. Hiking, thinking, just doing that simple thing of moving forward was running into my life. And so I finished my hike. I walked for 94 days. I walked to the Columbia River, which um, separates the states of Oregon and Washington. Beautiful, amazing place, the Columbia River Gorge. And I, my destination, there's a bridge that crosses that river. It's called the Bridge of the Gods. And, you know, I write fiction too. And I swear that if I had put that, if, if, if I'd written Wild as a novel instead of a memoir, my writer's group and my editor would have said, you can't call that place the Bridge of the Gods where she ends up. It's just too obvious, you know? Um, it's like, it's too much. Don't beat the reader over the head with meaning. But, you know, I love that life offers you these wonderful, you know, sometimes life is like, truth is like right there in the, you know, in the palm of your hand, and you just have to call it what it is. And, and so there I was on this sacred bridge. And I felt that I was... You know, I was on the sacred bridge of my life. I was, the, you know, the, everything was connected, you know. I love the symbol of the bridge because it is, it's, it connects this thing to the other. It connects Oregon and Washington in literal terms. But to me in my life, what it was connecting was um, the, the, the present and the past, the bearable and the unbearable, uh, the, the, uh, the way that I would always, always love my mother and miss my mother, and also the way that I would have to let her go and move on. Those, those opposing, those seemingly opposing truths that become one. The way that I had been a failure in so many ways and violated my own moral and ethical codes in some ways, and the way that I knew myself to be a good person who had something to give to others. I think about that kind of unity um, instead of thinking of those, uh, the, those opposing, those oppositions that we all, I think, um, in a kind of easy way cling to when we think about ourselves or judge others. Um, and it just, it was there. It was there for me that, that day. And I went off to my life. I had 20 cents when I finished my hike on the PCT and a friend who had a room in Portland where she let me stay until I... Uh, could get another job, another job waiting tables. That was the thing. I left this job. At, I left Minneapolis. I was a waitress. Did my hike. Went to Portland. I was a waitress. Um, and I was the same person I was. And I was profoundly changed on the inside. I, and and, and it, I don't think if you, I mean, many of you in the room have known me throughout all different times. And I'm probably pretty much the same person, you know, all that time. Um, but, but I do think that, that those, those most important transformations that we go through are sometimes those that are not necessarily um, 
perceivable, you know, that it's, but you know that truth, you know that different truth. Um, after my PCT hike, I was operating under a, out of a different truth, I think, which was I am going to fulfill my mission. I'm gonna be here. I'm gonna be present and awake in my own life and I'm going to do the work that I'm here to do that my mother sacrificed so much of her life so that I could do. And that to me meant being a writer. And um, so I wrote my first book, Torch, which like maybe 19 of you have read. <laughs> Thank you, you're my real fans. Um, <laughs> And then I wrote Wild. And then I wrote Tiny Beautiful Things. And it has really been, you know, th that th one of the great and beautiful ironies of that writing has been this thread, this thread through my work. Um, I think some people would say it's grief, writing a lot about grief. I would say it's writing a lot about love, because that's what grief is. Grief is love the fact that you can mourn somebody for so many years and that love has never diminished doesn't speak to me to the power of loss, it speaks to me to the, uh, to, to the power of love. And when my, you know, that day my mom died and I, I remember looking at myself in the mirror, I, she died in a hospital in Duluth, in St. Mary's Hospital in Duluth and there was a little um, bathroom at the foot of her bed and I went into it and she was lying in her bed um, dead and I just looked at myself in the mirror and, and there, it was like, I, it was almost like I just, it was like I saw my soul just kind of leap out of my eyes and I felt like I had lost myself. And um, you know, what I wanted most is, I didn't think that that soul within me could be restored until my mom was back. And what I've realized is through my work, my mom has been made alive, you know, to so many people. People around the world actually know my mom's name. They know. Bobby, they know her as an inspiration and a presence in their own lives. And so in some strange way through art, I brought, I brought my mom back. I brought my biggest um, love, you know, that biggest loss back to life. And that's the power, you know, that's the power of, of art. It's the power of literature. I feel like there has never been a day, you know, since I stepped off the PCT that that, that journey I went on hasn't informed me. Um, that sense of the simplicity and the, ra the radical act of that moving forward that I did every day. And I feel it, you know, still now. It's, it's, it's a thing that, that did allow me to become, you know, a writer and a mother. Um, I have two kids. I have a daughter named after my mom, Bobby, and I have a son, Carver. And it is um, this driving force in my life. A lot of people ask me, you know, that question, how, how does it, um, what is the epiphany? What is the big thing? And it really is the little thing. It really is that thing of what, the power of what happens when you do just um, put one foot in front of the other. So thank you so much. I'm going to take some questions. I know um, there are some people, uh, some microphones in the audience. Um, if anyone has any questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I have a question that's um, pretty simplistic and certainly not arcane, but one that we all probably want to know. Did your toenails come back and do they look normal? That's the number one question I get, is my, are my feet okay? Um, they are, my, my toenails um, have all grown back. But it took some, it took some time, it took a few years. And um, it was really interesting. So Reese had to have like a foot double or something in the movie. And, like, and um, they had to do all this crazy makeup on her toe and her, toe, her foot to make it look like she had gnarly toenails like me. But um, so she did not actually lose her toenails. Um, but I did and they did grow back. Yes, question. What advice do you have for someone looking for the courage that you had? You know, what would you tell your 23, 24 year old self? today? 
Well, in my, so I write this advice column called Dear Sugar. I haven't written it for a couple of years. Are there, <laughs> thank you. Um, so it's, it's the, the column is collected in Tiny Beautiful Things. And the title of the column, Tiny Beautiful Things, is actually a letter to my younger self, you know, to my 22-year-old self. And, you know, right away, you use that word courage, you know, somebody trying to find the courage. And I think that, that my first bit of advice is to, I think it's daunting um, to decide that you're going to be courageous, like to apply that, like, yeah, I don't think I'm courageous. I think that you make a choice at every moment to decide, you know, the way I frame it is, well, who's going to be your ruler? Is it going to be fear? Are you actually not going to do something because it scares you? And usually when, when I ask myself that question, I, I simply make the decision not to, to make fear my God. It's not so much about saying I'm really brave. It's just saying I'm not going to um, allow fear to limit my life. Um, you know, on the trail, I, as I wrote in the book, I really did actually say to myself, um, I am not afraid. That, that was the way that I was able to, to, to take, go hiking by myself that long because I knew that like I would get all messed up and I would be anxious about all kinds of things. And if I let, if I let myself, if I let my mind run down that channel, I was screwed. And so you have to decide you know, where your thoughts are going to run. This is true in so much of life. Um, in my writing too, like people I think are, many people are under this impression now that that I've had this success as a writer, that I just sit down and it's just like glorious, and I'm like, you're a genius, you know? And it's, it's actually not like that at all. It's absolutely hell, it's agonizing. And it's, I'm always full of doubt, and I'm always thinking everyone's gonna hate everything. And so I have to say, I have to shut that voice out and do it, you know? And, and so I think courage is about deciding to do things even when you're going to have all of these uncomfortable feelings and emotions and saying, I'm not going to, to pay heed to them. I'm going to acknowledge them and then, and then let them float away. It's an incredibly, um, it's about mindfulness. It's about consciousness. And it's, it's the greatest tool I have in my life, I would say, um, to do anything. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. So is there... There are just two microphones, is that right? Do you want to go every other one, or is there one over there, too? Okay. How about you, over there? Then we'll work our way. Okay. Are you um, asking a question, or are you just standing there? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> Somebody speak. I don't, okay. I can't, yeah. I'm just curious, do you still own Monster? Do I still own Monster? I do. I do. I own Monster. <laughs> I own, see, I didn't know that any of my junk in the basement would ever become famous. Um, so... <laughs> It's so funny, like I just have all that stuff. I have my tent that I had on the PCT, I have my sleeping bag, I have my backpack. And for the film, you know, they, they shot the film in Oregon and so, and I was really involved in the making of the movie and all of the props people, the set design people came and, um, and looked at all my stuff and they recreated it exactly. Some of the things in the movie are actually like my things, you know, things, things I own. Um, and yeah, so I have all that stuff. Monster still has a place of honor on a nail in my basement. <laughs> my dingy, terrible basement, yeah. So I'm 10 years out from a lit degree and I was going to be, you, be like you when I grew up and now I'm 32 and working in advertising, so you know. Um, I was reading yesterday and, and, and I know that we're supposed to write like a motherfucker uh -huh. and I fully intend to write like a motherfucker. And if you guys think she's crazy and you don't know what she's talking about, it's, it's a column in Tiny Beautiful Things. It's called it is, Write Like it a is. Motherfucker. It's my, my mother would be advice. dying if she heard me using this language. Um, I we're guess, saying it in the best way. Yeah. Absolutely. The nicest way. <laughs> Very Minnesota nice. Um, can you speak a little bit about the what you what that actually looks like so I get the the mental space of what that means but how the hell do you do it do you have a full-time job in advertising I do yeah see it's I mean obviously we all have to pay the bills and it's but I mean that's so hard because that's why I was a waitress because I knew that um if I had a, a job that 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 tapped that part of my brain, that creativity, that feeling that I was writing, and you know, that I, that I would go home and I would be empty. 
Um, so I purposely, even teaching, you know, I was right, right after I sold Torch, um, I had my first child and it was like, okay, you know, I'd gone this long writing and just being absolutely destitute all the time. My husband's a documentary filmmaker. And um, I just, we just had our first child and I was offered a full-time teaching job at a college in Portland and it was like job security, health insurance, you know, retirement plans. I don't even know what a retirement plan is, you know, so, um, and I, they offered me the job and I accepted it. And then three days later, I called them and said, I can't do it. And I decided that I couldn't do it because I knew what I was capable of. And I knew I, it, I could be a mother and a writer or I could be a mother and a college professor. I couldn't be all three. And even though like financially it didn't make any sense at all to say no, I did that, and, and it really was for me a very conscious choice about protecting, um, if not my time, I mean, it certainly took a lot of time still to wait tables, but just that mental energy. And so, you know, if you can't do that, if you can't leave your career, I'm, I'm the anti-career counselor, leave your career <laughs> in advertising. I mean, because here's what I'll tell you. I teach writing in workshops, and my classes are full of people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s who said, I always wanted to be a writer, and I never did because I had to have this job, and their heart wasn't in it, and they put it off for decades, and then they, th they regret it, you know? And of course, you don't know how writing is going to turn out. It is not a stable route. But I will say that you will probably never write your book until you find a way to answer this question. And whether that means quitting your job so you have more time to write or reshaping your life so that you actually have time to write around that job, um, it's not gonna get done. You're the only one who can do it. So, you know, when I say write like a motherfucker, I kind of mean like figure it out because it's not going to get figured out for you. You're the only one in the room. You're the only one who cares about writing that book. And that's what's beautiful, is you have the power to do it. So do it. <laughs> Who's next? I'm next. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm Linda Brandt, and um, I was so eager to come here and be inspired by what you're saying. And in particular, what, what I'm thinking about is, a year ago I started a lean-in circle, and I want to hear about, like, do you have a group of people who are backing you? And I want to just hear, like, the power of how you've pulled people to support you to get where you are. So. I have an amazing husband who is just my best friend and, you know, my partner in everything. I, I honestly think, you know, when I was, especially writing my first book, this previous question, I mean, I remember being in that place of thinking, I will never, ever be able to finish this book and just really being kind of psychically brought to my knees about it. Um, and my husband just believed in me so much. He believed in me more than I believed in myself in some ways, you know? And so that was really important. Having, um, I have an amazing circle of friends, you know, a great community of people who, who are really there for me. You know, I have a whole many people I know I could call any time of the night or day and they'd be there for me. And you know, some of those people I haven't talked to for years, and I know that some of those people are in the room. I'm going to call you at 3 a.m., Stacy. I'm sorry. But, you know, I mean, some people are like, you would be there, you know, and I think that's really important to have that sense of, um, you know, that it's, it's like, not to get cheesy, but it's that power of that kind of, um, I do think that love is the greatest force on earth, and I think that if you have that, you know, you can do then what I just told that previous questioner to do, like, that you can, you know, sort of, um, harness those forces within you that you ultimately have to to do anything you you know uh, to fulfill your dreams essentially so thanks for coming I don't I can't hear you now <laughs> Are they, oh oh I, what I wanted to say was I also heard that it's really important that people go to see your film on the first weekend that it's out that that really helps the film succeed 
So I just want to encourage people to really go out and do it. I know that my Lean In Circle will also organize people to really go awesome. and show up and get the inspiration. It's also really important to buy the, the movie yes. tie-in edition of the book featuring Reese Witherspoon on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a really cute cover. It comes out in November. Yes. Or whose turn is it? I can't oh. see the microphones. There we are. I think it's me. Um, I saw your piece in the New York Times maybe a week ago or last weekend uh, in Bookends. And it was in response to the question, is this a golden age for women essayists? Sometimes called essayists. Uh -huh. <laughs> and what I'm wondering is, if you can comment any more on that, and also if you could give any advice to people who are just beginning to write personal narrative and to find their voice as memoirists or personal essayists. And I know that's really general, but if you could look back at yourself, mm -hmm. just starting um, that journey, what would you say? Well, my advice really is to always be wildly ambitious. I mean, I make no bones about the fact that, that everything I've written, I've wanted to write the best thing that has ever been written. You know, even though I know I'm not gonna do that, I aspire for that. Like, I'm not trying to write like a sort of okay thing, you know? And I'm not trying to write for one audience, you know? And I think that that's why I answered that question in, my col in that column that way. You know, I've been a feminist all my life. Um, I absolutely, you know, identify as a woman writer, but I identify first as a writer. I don't write for women. A lot of women have been deeply and particularly inspired by things I've written, but the coolest thing for me also has been it's crossed that gender divide. At least half of my fan mail from Wild is from men. Um, and I think that what, what, how that came about was not by accident. It was really consciousness on my part of you know, writing it with that kind of human perspective. And also in, when it came to the marketing, just refusing to be pigeonholed. Um, when the Wild first came out, I time and time and time again had to correct journalists who came to me with the story of me already in their head. It's this very subtle way of bias. Um, they, you know, like all these radio, male radio hosts, they would, we would be like right before we went live on the radio, they would say, you know, I, I'm given all these books and I never have time to read them, but your book I love so much, I stayed up all night last night reading it. And I'd be like, thank you so much. And then we'd go on the air and the guy would say, Cheryl Strait has written a great book for women. And um, I would just finally say, well, you were a guy and you just told me you liked my book. And, it, and he would go, oh, you're right. Like, and, and I think too, like I think some of the sexism, is, he wasn't trying to be sexist. He just, it was this very subtle, discreet idea that women are only writing for women. And it's one that I perfectly rejected. And so my advice, <laughs> thank you. And so my advice to any artist of any sort or any person of any sort in any profession is just to always go in expecting, you know, like doing, do, giving it your all and expecting respect, you know, re expecting not to be pigeonholed and then when you are politely informing them otherwise. Yes, I just can answer like maybe one or two more questions. I'll, maybe I'll speed talk. I'm such a blabbermouth. I know I talk too much. I, I can answer all of you guys standing up. Yes. This uh, is kind of a short one. Okay. Uh, did you ever get an official weight on Monster at her heaviest? I and didn't. I brought everything but a scale. Um, so <laughs> I don't know, but it was really heavy. It was like, I think like 75 pounds. Because here's how I know. Reese on the set, her heavy, like they, they had different weighted packs, and her, her heaviest, I think, was like 60 or something, and mine was heavier, so. Because, and I can't, if, if I can be rude and ask how much you weighed at the time? I weighed a, a lot less than I weigh now, sweetheart. Now, um, <laughs> you know, what did I weigh? So I'm 5'7", I probably weighed about 130 or so, yeah, back in the day. <laughs> Reese Witherspoon is five feet tall, and I think she weighs like 12 pounds, so um, <laughs> she's as big as my thigh. Um, but... Yes, yeah, so who's the next question? Uh, would anyone like my shoe size? Um... <laughs> we do have a question from our Twitter account and our live broadcast. Awesome. They're asking, 
Cheryl, you talk about not allowing yourself to be afraid. You talked a little bit about that earlier, but could you do that hike today as bravely? Yeah, I mean, it's so, it's so interesting. It, it, it's hard to think of that question because it's like today as the person I am or today as the person I was. I, absolutely. I still go hiking alone. I love to hike alone. One of the things that's, that's every time I've gone backpacking by myself since my PCT hike that I'm always reminded of is it's always uncomfortable at first. You know, it's always like there I am and I'm pitching my tent and I'm all alone and I'm thinking, this is kind of not fun. You know, this is kind of a bad idea. And because uh, I get nostalgic about the, the experience on the trail. And that is my advice that I always give to people setting out on, you know, backpacking trips long or, shor or you know, short or long. It's like, just go in knowing that it's not, it's really going to actually be pretty miserable a lot of the time. Um, I mean, isn't that true? Most of us who go into the outdoors, it's like cold and it's hot and you're being swarmed by bugs and then, you know, it's like all of it's you have blisters and all these things happen. And then it's like in retrospect that it's fun. It's kind of like giving birth to a baby is only fun in retrospect, you know? <laughs> um, it's like, you're like, oh my God, that was the most amazing experience of my life. And then you do it again, you're like, what the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> um, Right? And um, so backpacking is kind of like that, too. Okay, yes. Well, I hope I asked this correctly, but I read Wild, which I can relate to in, in certain ways. And you wrote it as a memoir. It is a biography. It's definitely your life, your perspective, and I, I got to know you. Well, now I'm reading Torch, which feels to me as a third-person perspective. It's loosely based off your life. Um, so I'd see a lot of differences. And you talk a lot about your mom's cancer, and you start there. Why did you choose to write that first, and why did you choose to start there in the book? Because Wild, I thought, was your first book. So yeah, Torch, my first book, it, you know, it wasn't so much a choice. It was just like this book I had to write. And it is. It's fiction. It's also based on, you know, people who read it will recognize um, parts of the storyline, you know, a mother dies young of cancer. Um, this, it's set in a place that's very much like the place where I grew up, but I also took all kinds of liberties and license. Um, the funniest thing, that, so it's set in this fictional town I called Midden, which is sort of loosely based on McGregor. But everyone who lives in McGregor is like, they've decided like which character is which actual person. And I'll be like, but no, like I totally didn't, you know, mean that. But, you know, pe people, because it does seem so realistic, um, and it wasn't a choice. It was, it was the book I had in my heart that I had to write. And I think that most writers have that first book that kind of, it almost feels like it just rises from within. Whereas Wild for me, it was a much more um, uh, sort of conscious thing. I was sort of like, well, what, what am I going to write next? And I was casting around and I started to write about my hike. Um, I really felt that beginning Torch, I mean, it was after much, many years of work, frankly, to begin chapter one with a death, you know, the mother finds out she's gonna die and pretty soon she does. I realized that the book was more about grief and what happens after somebody dies than it is about, and, and while somebody's dying, than it, than it was about um, their life before that, you know? And so I just thought, it's kind of like, you know, just start out with like the, like in some ways start out with the, 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 the action, the catalyzing incident, you know, the catalyzing incident in my life and in that family's life was the, the sudden death of my mom. So I just began there. Yes, couple, couple more questions. Two, Look, two questions, neither of them are very deep. One is, is this your actual shoe? No. Okay. <laughs> the next question is, um, do you ever have dreams of some of those experiences? The one that comes to mind is the waking up with all the frogs. <laughs> do you ever have flashbacks and dreams of uh, some of those experiences? That's an interesting question. I don't think I've had a dream, or at least not in recent memory, uh, of being on the PCT. I don't think I have. I'll probably have one tonight, so <laughs> thank you. I'll wake up shrieking, covered with frogs. Yes. Hi, I think I'm next. My name is Cheryl, Hi, just Cheryl. like yours, with a C. The and right I way. Met you, yeah. And I'm also from Minnesota, 
And I also went and graduated from the University of Minnesota. Now, I heard about your book, I read about your book in the Twin Cities Reader a couple years ago. And I made a note to visit and see you when you came to the Amsterdam bar, which is not oh in my Amsterdam. Gosh. Yeah, I know. Do you, who, it's in St. Paul. I know what you're going to say, I think. And, and you took a couple of seconds, extra seconds with me, because I told you I was halfway through writing a book about my life. I lost my mother very suddenly from a heart attack when I was 22. It devastated me and my first marriage. And I was writing a book that I have now finished mm -hmm. thanks to your inspiration. <laughs> Congratulations. It's called, it's called Treasure Your Life. And it's a true story about how I almost ended my life after a devastating layoff from the University of Minnesota. But anyway, I don't have a question for you. I, thank you. Thank you for inspiring me to finish my book. Just like you said, you can do it. <laughs> I would like to give this to you. Oh, thank right you now. so thank much. You. You're so sweet. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy for you. OK, a couple more questions. The two people standing, and then we will go to the book signing. Hi, I read your book about six months ago, and I just finished hiking 700 miles on the oh, PCT. Awesome. <laughs> Did you have a blast? It was every moment that you could ever imagine, both positive and negative. Um, yeah. When you say it's miserable 75 to 95% of the time, that's completely accurate. Mm -hmm. But it's um, also like, don't, was it like one of the best things you've ever done? Yeah. Yeah. You know, in the retrospect moments. Yeah. No, it really was. Um, I have two questions for you based off of interesting conversations that were had on the trail about your book. Um, one is that many people call you Cheryl Stryad, and you talk about the word strayed in your book and what that means to you, and I wanted to know what you currently like to call yourself. And the last name, uh, the By second my question, name, Cheryl Strayed, Strayed. Yeah. Strayed, yeah. yes. <laughs> I know, I, people would be like, I love the book by Cheryl Stryad, and I was always like, okay. People trying to make me fancier than okay. I am, perhaps. <laughs> Um, the second question I have is, how have you come up against people talking about, your book is very obviously a memoir, and it talks about the truth of being a human, and it's not a book about the trail so much, but what it means for you to be on that journey. Um, and I encountered a couple people who were like, it's not about the trail at all, and she doesn't talk about the gear, blah, blah, you know, it's like, it's not, that, it's not about that if, you, if you've read it. Um, have you encountered that kind of... People who hate me? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that criticism that it's not a book about the PCT so yeah. much as a book about the journey. Um, yeah. And what is your response to that? You know, it's, yeah, if I, if I, if I ever want, like, to read people who hate me, all I have to do is, you know, just visit, like, a sort of elite backpacking forum, you know, like people who, people who you know, just decided that anyone who writes about the Pacific Crest Trail must write, you know, a sort of full, like, you know, guidebook about the trail and the flora and fauna and, you know, and I, what, I have nothing to say to them, you know, I'm like, I'm sorry my book wasn't your cup of tea. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I don't think that, I, I, I don't think that, that an artist should defend his or her work, you know, I think it either does the trick or it doesn't. And so, <laughs> that's, that's how I feel about those folks. Well, thank you for inspiring a non-backpacker to become thank a you. backpacker. Thank you. I'm so glad you went on a hike. Now, last but not least, hello. Hi. Um, in your opinion, what extent does nature play in helping one find solace? I think it's a deeply important aspect of, you know, the human spirit, the human experience. I, I think so often we think of ourselves in opposition to nature. We have that phrase, man versus nature. And one of the things I learned really early on in my life, really in those years that I lived um, in Aiken County and Beaver Township and, you know, going from feeling when we first moved on to that land and looking around and seeing uh, this kind of anonymous wildness um, slowly over time feeling like I had a relationship to it and that I was part of it. And I think that the, what the wild can do is really connect us, um, not just to, to ourselves, you know, when I said that sacred bridge earlier, 
I really think that one of the most powerful bridges is, is that between the, hu you know, the human experience and the wild experience. Um, it offers us silence, it offers us solace, it offers us perspective. In the wild, what we see every moment, every day is, is life and death, you know? Things, things are destroyed and things are regenerated every, you know, with the passing of every season. I think that there's something so elemental to us in that. Um, one of the things I write in Wild is there's this line that I say, wilderness, the wilderness had a clarity that included me. And this was at a time in my life that I felt so excluded, um, that I felt so outside of anything that was valuable or joyous about the human experience. And I go into this wild world and I see myself both insignificant and profoundly connected to everything. And you know, it's my God, really. Nature is, is truly my God. I think that um, there's a reason. You know, the reason that I was even able to hike that trail is because all these people before me had that same experience in the wild, and they fought to preserve it. And so that's the other thing. is it, it, I think going into the wild connects us throughout time to humans who, who had that same, same thing, that same, play, th that same feeling in the wild places. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll be signing books. If I could have your attention for one minute, we have a presentation for Cheryl. Uh, we have just this quick closing. So if you could have a seat, or you can feel free to stand. So I'm Cheryl Chapman, Executive Vice President of Dean of Diversity. And Cheryl, I was going to ask you if it's okay to call you by Cheryl. You have permission to call yeah. me by Cheryl. Okay, thank you. So Cheryl, first of all, we want to thank you for your inspiring, thoughtful, and penetrating words. Not referring to the alley, but penetrating words. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, she has a sense of humor. I thought I could have one too. <laughs> so that's good. Okay, uh, I know I speak for over the 2,000 people that are here and those who are listening to say that this was a very valuable and memorable night with you. You've provided such insight and you've shared experiences that will touch our hearts, souls, and lives for years to come. We've already mentioned that there will be the book signing. But Cheryl, one of the things that we wanted to share is that you've already mentioned to us how your mother, Bobby Lambrecht, went back to college along with you. And in fact, she had such a strong desire to obtain her bachelor's degree that in the beginning of her college career, we understand that she was commuting three hours each way to attend class. If that's not determination and significance, that was truly important to her. So tonight, Cheryl, in your mother's honor, we at Concordia University are happy to announce that we will be offering a $5,000 Bobby Lambrich scholarship to three incoming January students. Three, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we know that many of our adult students are juggling with busy lives, but they have prioritized working towards their degree, as your mom did. So again, Cheryl, we thank you for coming not only to Concordia, but to your Minnesota community and for spending such quality time with us and teaching, teaching us more about love. Thank you.